after a really long Advent break, it's, it's good to be getting back to Mark. I'm, I'm a creature of habit. I don't know about y'all. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the holidays, but I'm, I'm kind of a grumpy old man who's ready to get back to my routines, right? And the routine of being in Mark has been helpful for me this last fall, and I hope for you. So, so someone asked if I could just say, hey, Christian, um, where have you been for the last month? Why have you not been preaching? Uh, I assure you that uh, the, the money that the church uses to pay my salary has not been wasted. I have been very diligent with my time. Uh, if you've been, again, attending for the last month, you know that we've heard God's Word preached by all of our elders, and that's been a huge blessing, and I, I can't tell y'all how unique it is and what a, what a blessing we have at One Savior to be focused on training leaders. Uh, again, we're not a leadership guru network, but we are people who are just really simply trying to obey Jesus, who calls us to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so to, to train up qualified men to preach even better, you got to do it. You got to get the reps in. And so um, I have been appreciating my own opportunity not to sit back passively, but to listen to men preach and to pray for them. I hope you've enjoyed that too. Uh, the, the time off of preaching has given me time to do like the necessary, lame, boring, but important administrative ministry and planning ministry. That's a big part of my job. It stinks, but somebody's got to do it. And I guess it's me. Um, it's, it's allowed me to open up my schedule to extra counseling appointments. Um, some of y'all have had really difficult holiday seasons, and it's been a real blessing for me to spend extra time with you, praying with you, but also getting to counsel you. And also, I ain't, I ain't ashamed of this, I got to spend extra time with my family. So thank y'all for giving me the opportunity to do that, because it's a blessing to me, and, and, and y'all know it's actually a requirement for my job, not on my paper job description, but on my ultimate job description, that God says I have to manage my own household well. And so for all these reasons, I'm grateful for this time off of preaching I've had. But now I'm ready to get back, y'all. I'm up in the saddle. Let's do this. Let's open up our Bibles to Mark chapter 12. Um, I'll start by reading verses 35 to 37. Listen really carefully because everything else I say I hope is helpful and true, but this is the very word of God. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So, how is he his son? The great throng heard him gladly. We'll, we'll keep going in a minute, but let me begin by asking you this question. If you could say just one thing to a crowd of people, for some of y'all, this is extra hard to imagine. If you had temporary extrovert superpower and you could say one thing to a crowd of people, what would it be? What would you say if you knew, you knew, you would never have the chance to speak in public again? In 1939, uh, probably the most famous baseball player of his time, Lou Gehrig, started feeling really bad. Um, he, he, he didn't know what that was like to feel so bad that he couldn't play. He had played 2,100 plus straight games without missing. And at the beginning of the season in 1939, he would kind of played through the fatigue, but um, in one game he, he was so just unexplainably tired, he, he made a small mistake and took himself out of the game and immediately went to see a team doctor and was very quickly diagnosed with a very long medical disorder whose name I can't pronounce, but we, we now call ALS, which is so rare that it's, it's much more commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, the doctors told Lou Gehrig that he almost certainly would die in just a matter of years. So this man who had been so committed to his career as an athlete who was beloved by his entire city. He was a 17-year starter for the New York Yankees. He'd grown up in New York. He was a hometown boy. And so Lou Gehrig, in the middle of the season, after never missing a game for 17 years, 
had to very quickly and immediately retire from the sport that he loved and where he was deeply loved. Um, In 1939, two weeks after his diagnosis, after the news breaks and the world hears that Lou Gehrig is dying, he's invited to give a, 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 a speech in Yankee Stadium, which is filled to overflowing. And his retirement speech is, is one of the most famous last words ever given. Um, standing in front of this enormous crowd, Lou Gehrig says, Fans, for the past two weeks, you've been reading about the bad break I got. Yet today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of this earth. I've been in ballparks for 17 years and have never received anything but kindness and encouragement from you fans. And then he he spends almost half of his speech thanking individual players and members of the Yankees administration And each time after he thanks a specific person, he says, I'm lucky. He goes on, when the New York Giants, who didn't stay in New York much longer, when the New York Giants, a team you'd give your right arm to beat, and vice versa, sends you a gift, that's something. When everybody down to the groundskeepers and those boys in white coats remember you with trophies, that's something. When you have a wonderful mother-in-law who takes sides with you in squabbles with her own daughter. That's something. When you have a father and a mother who work all their lives so that you can have an education and build your body, it's a blessing. When you have a wife who's been a tower of strength and shown more courage than you dreamed existed, that's the finest I know. So I close in saying that I may have had a tough break, but I have an awful lot to live for. Y'all can understand why that, that's one of the most famous final speeches in history. Our verses for today, though, are the last public comments of Jesus that Mark records. For for the rest of the book of Mark, everything that is said and done happens behind closed doors with a small group of people, not to the crowds who hear Jesus gladly here and who have been following him for years, ever since he started his ministry in this South Effingham-sized area called Galilee. Remember, Mark is is giving us background information that, that, that people who already follow Jesus need to know in order to follow him better. And so in the backstory of the Christian life, this is a really big moment. It's Jesus' last public speech. And so before Jesus retires from public life, what does he want all people, disciples, non-Christians, what does he want all people, including us today, to know? If you want to sum it up, it's, it's really simple. What we've already read and what we'll read soon is really simply getting at this. Remember what it means to be a Christian. Don't, don't forget what you've seen and what you've heard, what he's calling us to do and what he's empowering us to do. Remember what it means to be a Christian. And we'll, we'll see re- really two things that the Lord Jesus gives us toward that. First, it's this. If we want to remember what it means to be a Christian, we must embrace the truth about who Jesus really is. To to Jesus, if you've got one more shot, one more thing to say to everybody, remember what it means to be a Christian by embracing the truth about who he really is. In, In these verses, Jesus is really carefully inviting the crowds to consider whether their assumptions about the Christ are right and accurate. That's a word we use a lot sometimes as a cuss word, but remember what that word Christ means in the context of the Bible. Christ is a Greek word that's translating the Hebrew word Messiah, which in our language that we use every day when we go to Walmart is simply God's chosen one. Someone that God has put forward for a special task. Hebrew-speaking Jewish folks understood that. They, they had lots of little C Christs in their culture. Every time a king was appointed, he was 
called a Messiah, a Christ. In the Old Testament, the prophets and also the priests were called Christs or little c, Christs, Messiahs. They were God's chosen ones for this very special task. But readers of the Old Testament and, and the people of Jesus' culture understood that there would one day be a capital C Christ, the Christ to end all Christs, who was regularly described and predicted and foretold. And in, in bringing it up to a crowd of people who know that background, of course Jesus quotes what he quotes. It, we won't turn there, but if you wanted to dig deeper, what Jesus quotes here in verse 36 is from the Old Testament, from um, specifically Psalm 110, the opening line. This gives me a lot of confidence to quote song lyrics and sermons because Jesus did it too. Um, in quoting Psalm 110.1, the Lord says to my Lord, or said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. We're hearing something very interesting and, and a very specific prediction of the capital C Christ, the Christ to come. In Psalm 110, which Jesus emphasizes, yes, David wrote it, but it was inspired by God himself. It was given through David by the Holy Spirit. God himself writes this song. He puts this prayer on David's lips. And in this particular one, he's writing down, David is writing down a vision that he was given. And in this vision, he overhears a conversation between two figures, the Lord and my Lord. This is tricky, but you can get it. When, when David refers to the Lord, that's how our English Bibles translate a Hebrew word that's kind of impossible to translate. We've referenced it throughout our series in Ruth the last few weeks, but remember, when the Old Testament uses the name the Lord, and most of our translations will have that in all caps, the Lord refers to what we, we, we best guess think is pronounced Yahweh. Or, or in King James language, Jehovah. It's, it's the personal name God gives to Israel and says, call me this when you worship me. Call me Yahweh. So that's the first character. The Lord is God himself, his personal name that only his people have the right to put on their lips. God is who he is. Lord is, that's his title. But y'all, Yahweh is his name. And for regions of tradition and honestly superstition, most Bible translations today still keep the Jewish custom of translating Yahweh as the Lord. So, pause there. Let's catch up. Verse 36, what happened in David's vision? Yahweh, the Lord, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, the right hand of God, the, the supreme place of honor and glory in all the universe. Yahweh says to somebody, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Do you see that Jesus doesn't actually comment on this whole thing? He just throws it out there to consider. His question to the crowds is, how can this amazing, royal, supernatural person, David's Lord, my Lord, this person who's appointed to the supreme, glorious role by Yahweh himself, how can that person also be David's descendant? Like David says, like we hear promised by God to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that the Christ, the Christ, would be an offspring of David. How can, how can that person come after David in time when David's watching this vision and hearing a conversation between God and this person who evidently exists? Do you see the confusion Jesus wants to stir up in our hearts and minds? We're supposed to not cross our arms and say, mm, yes, Jesus, I know that point. No, Jesus is inviting the crowds to be stumped for a second. Because when you're stumped, it makes you re-examine something you think you already understand. 
how is it possible for someone who isn't even born yet, someone who in David's culture would owe him honor, not the other way around, how could that person be the Christ? How does any of that make sense? Stepping back further, who could ever be this person? This person who has a divine relationship with the divine, who evidently is long-lived enough that he could be before David, and then a thousand years later, becoming in Jesus' day. Who could be the Christ if all those seemingly self-contradictory things are describing him? How can that be? Y'all, Jesus is a master teacher. He's not bringing up Psalm 110 to contradict it and say, we Jews, we goofed up by believing Psalm 110. Isn't this obviously wrong? No. No, Jesus never contradicts the word of God. So why does he do this? Jesus simply points out that the Christ evidently must be even more unique than the crowds thought he would be. That their understanding of the Christ, whoever he would be, as big as their imaginations would be, evidently it was still too small. Your, your, your Christ is too small, Jesus points out to these people. That he is, yes, both David's son and David's predecessor. He is this person whom God himself would choose to be the Lord and to be the master of all. This is what some of us have heard of before when we use the word paradox. It's a paradox. A paradox is something that when you look at it at first, it doesn't make any sense. Two things that seem to cancel each other out. Until you just sit and stare at it for a while and kind of think about it. And after you sit and stare and think about it for a little while, you realize, I have no idea how this is the case. But it's true. My, my, one of my favorite paradoxes we use all the time is the phrase, less is more. I remember the first time I heard that phrase, less is more, and thought, no, less is less. <laughs> you can never have too much of a good thing. More is good. Less is less. Less is, less is not more. Um... And then I tried making sweet tea for the very first time. Y'all, sugar is good. More is more. Um, there comes a point, I think the human body was not created to take in that much sugar. And some, some lessons, like, you only have to learn the hard way one time, right? Some lessons you only make once. And so even I, son of the South, even I was like, no paradoxically, somehow, some way, less is more. It's a paradox, but it's true. And Jesus is saying the Christ, whoever he is, must be a paradoxical person. He must be someone who, when you describe him, any of us would say, well, that person can't exist. He can't be. All these things, they cancel each other out, right? He, how could someone exist before David and after David? Who, who could be a human being who sits at the right hand of God? Who would God commission to be David's Lord and also be the Lord? Yahweh himself. How, how could a person be Yahweh? That's ridiculous. Do you notice here that Jesus does not provide the solution. He just leaves it dangling. In his last public sermon, he does not land the joke. He does not solve the riddle. He just puts a pebble in people's shoe that will just annoy them until they deal with it. How could this Christ be all these things? Jesus lays out this paradox to the public. He lays it out to us this morning. You can almost imagine the Lord Jesus saying, so, ladies and gentlemen, can you solve the riddle of who the Christ is? Friends, I don't know 
how well you know your Bibles, but let me, let me inject this into your understanding. The Bible shows that Jesus is an artist. And the Holy Spirit who inspired the way Mark wrote this down is an artist to Jesus and Mark communicate the truth, not just so that we would know it, but that when we know it, we would be persuaded by it. Uh, sorry, all my friends, brothers, and sisters who are engineers in the room, not everything's super logical. Not everything has a super neat and clean flow to it. Some, sometimes Jesus makes a point by not making the point, but annoying you so that you can't stop thinking about what the point is. And in this passage, these master artists, Jesus and Mark, are dangling right in front of us. Do you see the answer to the riddle? And are you persuaded that it's true? That the Christ would be both God and a real human being? Evidently eternal, coming before and after David. Friends, do you see what Jesus is teasing out of us this morning? Do you see what Jesus is showing us if we have the eyes to see as he is the one standing in front of the crowds and throwing the riddle out there do you see that the answer is literally standing right in front of them who, who could ever be the Christ who could ever be this God man friends I hope I hope I've teased you enough to annoy you you know the answer who, who could be the Christ who is the Christ friends Jesus himself is the Christ. And Mark's been priming that pump since the very beginning, right? You remember the very opening sentence of this book, that this is the book about Jesus Christ. You remember that in chapter 8, where the whole book takes a massive turn, the revelation, the, the idea that changes everything, is simply Peter calling Jesus the Christ. You remember in chapter 9, where Jesus himself calls himself the Christ. And now in this last public speech, Jesus wants everyone to know he is this paradoxical person. He is the one predicted by the Old Testament. He is God's chosen one who puts all the other chosen ones to shame. N no more riddles, no more cutesy teasing. Friends, let me put it plainly. Jesus is God himself. He, he is everything the Christ has to be. Everything the Christ has to be and everything the Christ is, both a human being and the one eternal God. He is the human son of David and the never-beginning, never-ending divine son of God. And most of Mark's book has been showing us the first half of that paradox. We have seen Jesus almost embarrassingly human, haven't we? We've seen that Jesus is a fully normal human being with our emotions and our needs and our limitations. But we have also seen, and right now we are seeing in these verses, the other half of that paradox. The second thing that makes the first thing make no sense. Until... You sit and you stare at it for a while. Until you, until you look at the evidence again. And ultimately until you are led somehow, some way, to take Jesus at his word. That even if you can't explain it, even if you don't know how one and two are both true, you recognize that this person, the long-awaited one, is right in front of you. That he, he is the one being preached to you. And, and in this set of verses, he is the one preaching. Friends, do you, do you see what this difference this makes for you? Friends, trust that Jesus is God. Or, accept that you're not a Christian yet. No matter what else you may believe about Jesus, if you cannot bring yourself to very simply say, Jesus is God, then by his own teaching here and the abundant evidence of the Bible, you are not yet a Christian. 
Friends, if you, if you don't accept that Jesus really is God, you should not be a member of the church yet. If you don't take Jesus at his word here that he really is God, you should not take the Lord's Supper yet. In fact, I, I'll, I will plainly, I, I hope you hear me say it with great love and compassion, if you do not believe that Jesus is God, please, friend, do not take the Lord's Supper in our church or any other. Friends, if you deny that Jesus is God, then Jesus, to this point, denies that you are a Christian. No wonder this is part of his closing statement. No wonder that this is one of the last bells Jesus rings. Because, friends, to trust Jesus, to accept that everything he says is true, even if you and I don't know how to work it out, that is not to take a blind leap of faith. To, to accept obvious falsehood. It's not. That's not what faith is. That's not what Christianity is inviting all people to consider. No. You and I cannot comprehend the mystery of exactly how God took on humanity, like we confessed earlier, for us and for our salvation. It's, it's above our pay grade. It would be easier for a roach to understand rocket science than for us to understand the depths of the wisdom and power of God. Christ is not calling the crowds or us today to comprehend things that only he can comprehend. But he is commanding all people to consider, to accept, to trust. That we don't have to understand everything about God's mind to understand a little bit about his heart. That he loves us. That he has come for us. That he tells us the truth. And so, friends, accept what Jesus says with all the mystery, with all the uncertainty. Not because you're smart enough to get it, because none of us are. But because he's trustworthy enough to believe. If you've never trusted that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is God and Lord, that can change right now. Would, would you ask this Jesus, who continues to reign above all things, who right now in this moment, the Bible tells us, is sitting at the right hand of his Father, ruling over everything, do you recognize that ignorant and blind and rebellious people can speak to this Jesus and say, I think I'm wrong. Please help me. Do that, friends. Everyone who's a member of this church has done that in one way or the other, and you can too. Friends, trust that Jesus is the Christ, that he is God, and that he has done this for you. And you will be saved. Brothers and sisters, this is not just an evangelistic moment, although it's, it, it seems clear here that Jesus is practicing public evangelism. For you who are, who are members of Jesus' body at one Savior or beyond, you who already trust that somehow Jesus is everything he says to us. Do, do you recognize what this, what this mystery puts on your life? Do you, do you recognize how this affects you, brothers and sisters, when you embrace that Jesus is the Christ, that he is who he really is? Brothers and sisters, worship this Jesus. Worship someone who is more impressive than you and I could ever imagine. Who is more accomplished, who is kinder, who is stronger, who is wiser than you and I could ever begin to dream of because he is God. Brothers and sisters, as you take the good news of Jesus to other people, understand very simply, there is nothing true about God that isn't fully true of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Jesus is everything it means to be God. The Jesus who loves you never started existing. You and I can never imagine in our wildest dreams a time or a place when Jesus wasn't already there. The Jesus who listens to your prayers as you're getting ready for work or when you're up in the middle of the night with a sick kid 
that Jesus is the one who told the Atlantic Ocean where to stop and Tybee Island where to start. The, the Jesus that we remember at Christmas was at the same time as Mary was nursing him, he was upholding and directing world affairs. That's Hebrews chapter 1, if you want to check that out. This Jesus, who is your friend and your comforter, is greater than you can imagine. So brothers and sisters, at the beginning of a new year, where some of us are doing a spiritual checkup, you who follow Jesus, can I invite you to ask this question? Do you want to feel greater feelings for Jesus? If you do, start by thinking bigger thoughts about Jesus. Not making things up, but seeing that if you want to stimulate your heart, Jesus often works through the mind. And he tells our minds exactly what to believe. Because the true Jesus is far, far more exhilarating than any fake, knockoff, dumbed-down copy that we or anyone else could imagine. The real Jesus. You and I need to know the truth about him. He is the Lord because he is God himself, and that changes everything. And as a pastor, it breaks my heart when people stubbornly refuse to think that it matters whether or not Jesus is God. But what difference it, does it make in my life, you might ask? Mark shows us. Mark shows us in, in the way that he tells this next story. In these next verses, he records Jesus' comments about two very different kinds of people. He, he doesn't say that either group claims to follow him. But if you know the truth about who Jesus is, and you take him at his word that he really is God, then, then that means you've got to know this next part too. This is the, the, the last point we'll make this morning. Jesus shows us in these next verses, not only if, if we want to remember what it means to be a Christian, yes, we must embrace who he truly is, but lastly, we have to sacrifice everything for the benefit of other people. Verse 38 in his teaching, Jesus said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And... He sat down opposite the treasury in the temple where all this is going down. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. In our currency today, she puts in about three bucks. He called his disciples to him. He summons them and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who were contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Remember that these scribes are, are the highly educated religious leaders. They've run into Jesus a bunch of times. They don't like him. But they are beloved by the average person who, who understands them to be very religious, very moral, very, very outwardly focused in life. Jesus says to give those dudes a wide berth. Why? Because of what they like. Did you notice that? They're dangerous dudes because of what they like. They like these six things that he lists. And, and what do they all have in common? These six loves that the scribes have? All six revolve around this. The scribes get something out of it. The scribes like to get attention. They like to get business contacts. They like recognition from other religious people. They like recognition in society at large. They like 
money, even if it puts widows in the poorhouse or on the street. They like money. And they like having a high view of their own spirituality. They like that. But the truth, according to Jesus, is this. Living for yourself and pursuing your desires that are all about you consuming more and more, getting more and more, no matter how religious that looks like on the outside, will bring judgment. It will bring condemnation. Jesus says it will bring greater condemnation, evidently, than some other people will receive. Y'all, this is a critical warning for one Savior. Don't, Don't miss this, brothers and sisters. The American church today, if you turn on the news or, or check social media, you understand the American church is rightly and finally having to face the disgusting rot of spiritual abuse. And Jesus' description of the scribes paints a perfect picture of what spiritual abusers do today. Spiritual abuse boils down to using religion as an excuse to get stuff from people. That's all spiritual abuse is to get respect, to to get a feeling of power over other people, or a feeling of importance, to get money or sex from other people. Friends, how do you know if someone is spiritually abusing other people? It's not by their tone of voice. It's not by the size of their church. You and I can tell if spiritual abuse is going on just by watching the direction that the giving in their life flows. If a person's life is all about receiving and receiving and receiving and taking and taking and taking and not giving, not sacrificing, something awful is happening, even if the bomb hasn't blown up yet. Are other people being manipulated or pressured to give something to them because of their status or their apparent spirituality. Y'all, take Jesus at his word. They might get little old ladies' pensions, and they will also get hell. And the two do not balance out. They will get both unless they repent. And if that lands on your heart, if you recognize, I am a taker, dear friend, repent. Repent. Do not receive the greater condemnation. Contrast that, that whole picture of evil, of ugliness, with the poor widow. Mark emphasizes it in case we missed her the first time. He calls her poor, he calls her a widow, he calls her the poor widow twice. Lest we miss the point. She ain't just poor. She's not just helpless. Y'all, she bad off. She real bad off. She has nothing. Y'all, how much the scribes took from other people, how much it is, it's not the point. The point is they took from other people in the name of God. But this woman, who because of her crushing poverty, you would never expect this from her, she gave to others in the name of God. She gave everything to others because she belongs to God. And Jesus says, there's something about that all Christians need to see. The way Mark ends this chapter, this is the final point of Jesus' last going away speech. We cannot overlook this seemingly small story because this woman's example is here for a reason. If you and I have read Mark up to this point, if you and I have seen Jesus' power, if you've seen Jesus' compassion, if you've seen his wisdom, if you've seen his heart, if you've seen Jesus' justice, if you've seen Jesus' divinity, then give everything to him and the people around you. Well, what does that even look like? How do you start with everything? How How do you give everything away? Is that just a mindset of, yeah, I I give everything to other people, I I think. I mean, I want to, but I don't, do I? 
let, let's, let's break this down into bite-sized pieces. Think about how you could give everything away to Jesus and to other people at work. What if, because you belong to Jesus and follow him, what if you gave every minute of the workday to your boss, to your customers and your clients? If you work at home, to your children? What if you gave the time of your workday to serving other people to the best of your abilities? Lots of weaknesses, lots of failures, lots of opportunities to repent and to confess. What if you gave all of it to people who are not patient with you, who hold you to unfair standards, who try to squeeze blood from the turnip? What if you and I worked like that? Not because my boss will like me better, and not because if I play my cards right, this could lead to a better job down the road. What if you and I worked like that because that's what we've got to give? And Jesus says that's what it looks like to follow him. What if, what if, we, what if we followed Jesus like that at work? What if we followed Jesus like that in our neighborhoods? For example, what if you live in a neighborhood with lots of little kids, like I do? I'm contributing to the problem, but I'm also not the only one. Have you thought about the kids in your neighborhood who do not have a good home life, who, who, who desperately need friends, who desperately need safe adults in their lives to take an interest in them? Have you thought about keeping your fridge stocked with popsicles or putting an otherwise pointless foosball table in the garage? or giving your phone number to their parents or their grandparents so they can know there's somebody on the street that if they need to text for help, they will get it from you. That if they need to open up about their parenting issues or something else, there's one halfway decent person in this neighborhood who will listen. Because my, my place in this neighborhood is not just about my comfort and my happiness my place in this neighborhood is to serve the neighbors. But, Christian, that would be a huge hassle. I'd have to give up a lot of time. I'm tired after work, man. That costs a but Do you know how much a foosball table costs? I don't because I'm a tight one. Those kids will interrupt me when I'm trying to make dinner. Those kids will knock on my door when I'm trying to watch TV. They will make my house loud when I just want my house to be quiet. They will get their broken family situations all over my nice, clean calendar. Friends, our sinful desires do not stiff-arm Jesus' love. So listen to me. If and because Jesus is the God who created you and sustains your life and provides all your basic needs and forgives you over and over and over again and is empowering you to change with his own energy and to become more like him because that is who he is. He does not need your permission to give you orders. And I don't say any of this with any shame or, or sarcasm or any teeth to it, but listen, brothers and sisters, if you belong to Jesus by faith, you and I owe him everything. That's, that's the cost, everything. It's not hard to remember. It's just really hard to do. And that changes what kind of neighbor you are. That radically changes what kind of employee or business owner you are. When you follow Jesus, you stay you, but you is being changed into a different you. But how do we face the fact that deep down, all of us are deeply uncomfortable with that idea? How? None of us wants to sacrifice 
what we most want. None of us likes the fact that this has implications for the marriage we want, and we don't like the idea of sacrificing the marriage we want for the marriage Jesus wants me to have. What about sacrificing the family I always wanted and the picture of what that looks like? The, the financial security I've worked so hard for. The romantic pleasure I so crave. The social acceptance I get from other people. How, how do we become like this woman and sacrifice everything for other people? Brothers and sisters, if you are imagining this scene play out in your head and staring at this wonderful example of a woman and feeling crushed that you're not more like her, you and I are staring at the wrong person in the story. I just want you to shift the eyes of your mind over 30 feet and look to the teacher who doesn't just say she's a good woman, who says she's a good woman because she's a lot like me. Jesus himself, friends, models total and complete sacrifice for other people. But unlike this wonderful woman, as good of an example as she is, Jesus doesn't just show what kind of people we ought to be. Jesus makes us into the kind of people who can do this. And Jesus actually changes sinners. Not by cracking the whip, try harder, do better. Not by studying more, not by feeling bigger feelings, but Jesus creates this faith and he makes us grow in obedience when we simply rest in him. That he all by himself is enough, just like we sang. Put those words that we sang into your hearts, that Jesus is enough. He's enough to meet our needs. He is enough to meet the needs of the world through us. And by taking this Jesus at his word, that if we know him, we will become like him even in ways that seems truly impossible otherwise, if you get that, you have gotten the point of Jesus' last public address. I say it's his last public address. But somebody in here knows the Bible better than me and is just too kind to correct me. This is not Jesus' final address, is it? This is not the last time Jesus appears and speaks in public. The rest of Mark, which we will be way pulling the throttle back on to work through methodically and slowly, the rest of Mark is going to show the final days of Jesus' life. And they are filled with conversations behind closed doors. But the very last time Jesus speaks in Mark, it will be in public. Many people will hear him. But his cries and his groans on the cross do not sound like well-reasoned, logical teacher talk. They sound like our salvation. Brothers and sisters, it's what happens on that cross that makes this kind of faith possible and real for real people like us who look to Jesus to provide everything he requires. And we don't just hear that and believe, although from my lips to God's ears, may you believe everything he tells us. It's not just with your minds and your ears that you meet with this Jesus. You and I meet with him by faith at his table. Let me invite the musicians to come back. This morning, if you have seen Jesus set the bar here and recognize you're down here on a good day, and you just want to be where he is, brothers and sisters, 
through the power of his spirit, your Lord Jesus is at his table. And this morning, he is there sitting down at the table, looking at your place setting, wondering what's taking Christians so long to wrap it up. I just want to meet my people. If you, if you embrace this Jesus for who he says he is, and you not only recognize what he's done for you, but you rest in it, if you truly trust in this Jesus despite yourself, and if trusting in him has changed the orientation of your life so that you have brought your whole self, sins and everything to him and repented of them, if you have been baptized as a publicly confessing member of his people, and if you're not a member of our church, but you are in good standing with your local church, brothers and sisters, I can't hold you back. I don't, I'm just, I'm just the messenger. Jesus invites you to this table. If, if those things are not true of you yet this morning, if you don't accept the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done, if you have not repented of your sins, if you haven't been baptized, or if you're not in good standing with your local church, we are so happy you're here. We, we genuinely and sincerely want to love you and serve you, whoever you are. But Jesus himself says, this table is not yet for you. So please, while the rest of us do come at any point during the song, would you please stay in your seats? Um, we want to serve you, but he himself says, this table is not for you, not yet. Brothers and sisters, I'm done. Let's stand up, and let's sing, and let's come to Jesus at the table.